On behalf of the Computer History Museum, I would like to welcome Mr. Chi Fun Chen, uh, Dr. Chi Fun Chen. He is the co CEO of Synopsis. And uh, my name is Uday Kapoor, and I am the uh, volunteer in the History Museum for the Oral Histories program. And on, um, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, very important interview. Uh, we can start from your uh, childhood. I believe you were born in Taipei, uh, Taiwan, in 1956. Uh, and uh, so maybe we can start with that. Tell us about your background. Okay. Well, first, we say thank you for the honor of coming here. And this is a wonderful institution. And it's a big honor because you've been a good colleague, good friend, and good customer. <laughs> so thank you. So, uh, and, and it's a big honor because uh, I was born in 1949. Yeah, so okay. thank you. I wish I was born in 56. <laughs> it would make me younger. <laughs> but I, um, I was born in 1949 uh, in Taiwan, in Taipei, as you said. And in my early life, I was, I think I did the reverse. If you know, 49 is a pretty historical time in China and Taiwan. Uh, but when I was three years old, I went to Hong Kong. You know, I did not go there voluntarily because I was three. My parents were there, so we went to Hong Kong. Most people were going the other direction. And, um, and then I stayed in Hong Kong till I was 18, 19, and then came to America and been here since 1968. See. So tell us about your parents. Or what did your father do um, and how many siblings you have? Oh, thank you. I, um, I have well, one brother here who's a lawyer, uh, Chi Hong, who's in Rowu City, and two sisters who is in, um, Thai, uh, in, in Hong Kong right now, where my mother is. My father passed away about two years ago at 96, had a very good life. I can tell you briefly about our family history. Um, I don't know how much of it is true, but you grew up <laughs> listening to all these stories, and they become embedded in your memory. But uh, we grew up, we're eight, I'm eighth generation Taiwanese. And because Taiwan has a lot of family history, we have the family history book at 32 generations from shaman. And then 40 generations ago came from Kaifeng. It's about 757 and this Tong Dynasty. But the key thing is uh, my father was always a businessman. I'm trained as an engineer, but at home I'm always talking business. I think that's why. Eventually, I'm a reluctant manager of businessmen going to business. But um, he, our family history is quite a little bit interesting, complex, and I don't know if it's true or not. We were poor and then rich and then poor and then rich, and mostly because um, my father was very ambitious in business. And so when he went to, uh, we went to Hong Kong because we had the mining right for seaweed in the you know, right now in the news is all these South China Island. Yes. Uh, one of the island is called uh, Tongsa Island. Instead, of, it's one of the group. It's the East San Archipelago, Pescatory Island. He had a mining right for seaweed, and some partner took the ship out. So he chased them all over Southeast Asia. 1949, you don't go sue a lot of people. You just go chase people. <laughs> and um, it's 1950. Ended up in Hong Kong, not having a lot of money stay there, make some money, and then eventually get the family over. So that's how we grew up <laughs> in I that see. era. Yeah. So you don't have memories of Taipei, I assume, because you went to Hong Kong at an early age. Um, not that much, but because eventually we do go back and forth. You know, like at, um, like at home with my parents, we speak Taiwanese, right, Fukinese, and then, but in Hong Kong you speak Cantonese. And then I learned Mandarin in America, <laughs> you know. So. Right. So um, how was your schooling like in Hong Kong? And uh, uh, what kind of schools did you go to? Were there any mentors, any special teachers? Yeah, I would think some people who influenced me a lot, just to complete that picture, right? My father went to Hong Kong, and uh, this is would influence some of our thinking because eventually he did business and got rich. And the way that he got business got rich is because most of the fishermen were, most of the seamen who were fishing were Okinawans, 
So now the Okinawans come back and um, they start trading. And trading from brass and copper, which is necessary in, in Hong Kong. And one of the ways you get those was they were mining the beaches. But if you know Okinawa, the beaches has a lot of metal <laughs> and after the war, right? <laughs> so that's how you get trading done. And so when we were going to school, we had a lot of fishermen and everybody around. So why the influencer? Well, when I was early on in my age, we were a family where I was quite good and rich. But then the, sea fre- the fleet got too close to Vietnam. And you know, there's a lot of things got confiscated. So we were mostly bankrupt during more young ages from time it was fourth grade to college. And so school was very important. You know, so I went to mostly subsidized school. It's a good school in in a great school in Tatsang and partially at my high school was very um, I thought very straight but very good. They were run by Jesuits. You know. So between Okinawa and seamen drinking at home, coming back every two weeks, and Jesuits, I had a very, I think, shaped my character in many ways, <laughs> you know. Very good. So what kind of mentors did you have as teachers? What subjects did you like? Yeah, I, I always like uh, to learn and a lot of other things. I think uh, some of the teachers who who influenced me are the ones that actually show good character. I mean, I was interested in what they teach, but mostly I was interested in them also. So um, I like my math teacher. I think that's why I like math. You know, it's not, I don't think I like math and therefore I like my math teacher. <laughs> you know, so I think you're very much influenced by a lot of the people that comes in and teaches you stuff. You know, yeah. And then my mother is obviously the the dominant influence in the family, you know, host the disciplinary side of the business, of the family, you know, so. So you mentioned one brother, did you have other siblings or just the? I have two sisters, yeah, my brother become a lawyer here, I have two sisters, they all came to school uh, in U.S. and they went, I mean, my brother's here, but my two sisters uh, graduate here, I mean, Grace and Doris, and then went back to, uh, went back to Hong Kong. Okay. So after school, uh, how did you select or where did you go to college? Good question. I was uh, very much, um, you know, my family financial is not great, but I always liked to come to America. My brother come first. And uh, in 68, in 67, 68, Hong Kong was in a, uh, actually a very tumultuous time. Um, I, I w- actually went to school, uh, you know, in Hong Kong, the university is three years, and the school, the high school, we go to 12th, 13th grade. So I almost went through 13th, there's no such a 13th grade. This is a 12th and 13th is a college system, right? And then I applied, my mother said, we'll, we'll, lend, we'll borrow money, lend you money, just go to U.S. So I applied and I ended up at Rutgers State University in New Jersey. I didn't quite know where New Jersey is. I just know it's in America. I was very excited. And it happened to be a good choice for me. So you had good um, undergraduate uh, education, uh, like you mentioned, the 13-year schooling. Yes. Uh, So you had good uh, engineering or technical schooling? I think I ended up with the best of both. I think... um, in the interview, you see, I consider myself a very lucky person. Just a lot of people helping me, a lot of decisions that come are just luck in my mind. I mean, and um, I came and I got to Rutgers, gave me a scholarship because it's a school that gave me a scholarship. I, I can, I can, that's the only way I can afford it. It was great. Uh, but I started in the freshman class and it's very clear after one semester, it's very, the teachers say you need to place out the class because, you know, in, in Hong Kong, they're very, very focused on one thing but not on another, and math was very focused. Like, you know, you're in partial differential equation, and you started with XY graph. <laughs> so, so actually, I tried to place out the course, but uh, they take $25 per course to place out, you know, and you place out physics, chemistry, and there's, I don't have money to place out other courses. So 
I ended up taking other courses, you know, psychology, economics, second semester, to get to the, because you cannot take double E course without going through. So I think, luckily, that provided later on actually a much more, a very useful platform, which I was not planning. Um, and then I think the other good thing was I met a professor named Tom Marshall, who eventually became the dean, and he was just brand new coming in from, I remember from Stockholm, Cham Chalmers University. I don't know all the, but I was a young student. I was fascinated every day when I wake up by everything. And he needed a, uh, he wanted to have, he was brand new, so he wanted to do some research, and I was a junior. And there wasn't that many, you know, because he just got there. Not many grad students, so I did a, uh, an honor thesis with him, with my junior. I learned a lot because it was probably one of the most complex theses I've done. And one day I think I'll go back and read it and maybe understand it. <laughs> right. So you did your master's there first? Uh, I went, after that, I applied and I did my master and, uh, at Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio. So uh, I was trying to now now trying to go west, <laughs> you know, yeah. And so that was uh, in what field? Uh, so how did you choose your special? Great question, because um, I got very really excited about the electrical engineering, and then uh, this was on doing tridiagonalization of matrices on my, uh, master, on my bachelor thesis, uh, and on and basically optimization. But I was always interested in the biology side, and um, which I don't know, I just kind of interested. So I apply, and I was in the MD-PhD program of Case. That's why I went to the biomedical engineering. Yeah. But after one semester, uh, I did go take all the physics. So one semester, I realized that I'm really much more interested in the <laughs> computer side because it was kind of tough uh, dissecting, you know, animals. <laughs> it was a side I didn't bargain for. It was not the studying, of, <laughs> you know. So, um, so I went into computer engineering, and you know, I believe Case is the first university in U.S. to have a degree in computer engineering, a for an accredited degree in computer, because it's a combination of computer science, electrical engineering, at that time it was system engineering, right? So, so that's where I did my master. And then you continued on to do your doctorate? Right. Uh, interestingly, my master, maybe the, I may be the only one, at least that I know of, that did a master degree on, on a light bulb, okay? Because, um, Actually, it was pro published in the proceeding IEEE, probably one article you can see on a light bulb. Because um, uh, General Electric, one of the main profit center is light bulbs. And the main headquarter for uh, light bulb for GE is at Leda Park, Cleveland, Ohio, where Case was. So they sponsor, they sponsor a, um, uh, my master, because I needed financial aid, right? And so the, it was, uh, but it was the beginning of uh, pattern recognition, because I joined the company. I joined the uh, case computer engineering department in the digital signal processing. Uh, Dr. Wenlin was my master PhD advisor, and um, uh, and the the uh, mostly in facial character recognition, speech recognition, and this was trying to examine light bulbs, filaments, because you know electrically, you know that they can be, you, you can test whether it's connected or not but they're not connected mechanically, it will still fail. So you have to do visual inspection. And I think it really was you. So it was a strange topic to talk. I, I know a lot about light bulbs, <laughs> which may not be useful. <laughs> yeah. So then I continued to do my PhD in Singapore. I think uh, Dr. Wen Lin was a really good professor who taught me a lot about signal processing. And I, uh, the, the head of the computer engineering department, which is new, was also a very interesting person. His uh, name is Ed Glazer, you know, very inspiring person. Um, because the, one of the first courses I took was computer graphics from him. We have an Evans and Sutherland graphical machine, right? And he tried to teach you how to envision, you know, you have a donut and you have a sphere hitting it, so you had to look at the cross plane, envision the cross plane 
of every one of these. And it was, it was first mathematically challenging, and it's inspiring because uh, if you know, at least is blind from four or five years old <laughs> and teaching computer graphics. A very optimistic guy, very inspiring, very technically strong. Uh, uh, it's just it's a great experience. I mean, you, I'm always in awe of the people I work with or learn from. And um, so I did my PhD in digital signal processing, basically uh, on speaker independent speech recognition, which is quite a fashion at a time, of course, machines. We don't have your machine yet. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what year did you, get, did you get your PhD? I got my mass, uh, PhD in 77. I graduated in 72. My master in 74. So I have a very, <laughs> you can see I'm a very, cons <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly at the regular pace, not fast, not slow, <laughs> you know. So what uh, happened after that in terms of your career, after you got your PhD? Uh, were you looking for further research or were you looking to work in the industry? Um, yeah, for, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the personal side later, I know, but in 75, I graduated in 77, in 75 I got married. So 77, I'm looking for a job, <laughs> right? I need to make a living, get a job. Uh, and. I didn't have a permanent residency yet, so I, there are not many jobs available. I mean, the process of applying. And so in between, I work at Picker X-Ray. But the year after I started looking for, uh, I got my permanent residency and started looking for a lot of jobs. Um, in the first year when, before my permanent residency, I think I have like I make, uh, eight applications, I get one offer. In the next year, we talk about I make eight applications, I get eight offers, so life is good. But, I really appreciate that one year spent at Picker X-Ray because I was a mathematician for the, uh, for the CAT scanning, which is, you know, at that time, you know, the Nobel Prize was just handed out a few years ago to the Hounsville for the CAT scanning. And the CAT scanning is mostly a matter of, um, it's actually a two-dimensional Fourier transform in your brain, the back projection. And just because you are an engineer, exciting to me was one thing is, you have to know the difference between the skull and the brain, right? Because if you don't have enough resolution, since it's a, since it's a Fourier transform, it's just a pass a filter. If you don't know, if you are under dam, you don't see the tumor. If you over dam, you see, you think you get hemorrhage, but just ringing. So of course the, the exact frequency is the Nyquist frequency between the brain and the, so, so they need someone to calculate what is the Nyquist frequency of the crystal and the CAT scanner. It was a very exciting job for uh, at least that time. And then I applied for jobs, and then um, I was very lucky I got the intel, you know, so. So they were looking for digital signal processing expertise at that time? Uh, thank you for, I'm not sure I would be considered an expertise. <laughs> I'm very excited about it. And uh, I interview, uh, I really didn't know much company. I mean, I always wanted to go to Bell Lab. I got an offer at Naperville. I think they were doing the ESS4. Got offer from different places. Uh, and then this company, Intel, I was very excited because the people who interviewed me uh, was Ted Hoff. Uh, I didn't know Ted was the only fellow of Intel at that time. I, I, if I knew, I wouldn't know what a fellow is, <laughs> actually. But uh, I know the Whitrow Hoff algorithm because I'm, I'm a digital signal processing, adaptive filter, so I was very excited. He's a this guy I can learn from, uh, an engineer's engineer. I mean, computer, you must know him. Uh, he's just an engineer, engineer, we're still good friends. So uh, it was a little bit, I uh, told my wife, let's, let's go. <laughs> I had no idea what Intel did. I, I have some idea of what Intel does, but I don't know anything about company. Because in between, uh, my, mass, my PhD in the summer, uh, we were teaching microprocessor courses. It was new, right? The 4004, the 8008 was the time. I think 1978, when I joined Intel, it was the year of 8086, I believe. I did just before or after. Because I always say, at Intel, we measure it just like any other microprocessor, not by the year, but by the processor time. Like, I joined when it's 86, and I left just at, at the 386 time. 
<laughs> in terms of time frame, <laughs> you know. So, so what was uh, your assignment and how was your career at Intel? Can you tell me? Oh, it was very exciting um, because I met a lot of people, but the first assignment was Intel was doing the first signal processor, the 2920. Um, we call it the first digital signal processor, other people call it the analog signal processor, but it was pretty exciting. It has a 25-bit um, uh, digital, no multiplier, just shift and add, and analog in and an analog out. So my first assignment, um, there was a very good team of signal pro uh, chip designer, and my first assignment was how do you program this thing? You know, so um, in fact, the only machine there was the 8080, we had the MDS-80, right? Because uh, not, not all analog uh, engineers have wax machine <laughs> or that. So it was to write like a, like a signal processing compiler. How do you put poles and zeros in the, um, in the S-plane? So hark back to almost my bachelor thesis on the filters and you know, the optimize. How do you put poles and zeros in the S-plane and translate them by mass C transform, let's say, into the Z-plane? And then translate them into 2920 code, which is shift and add, shift and add, and all the coefficient. And doesn't have um, floating point at that point, right? So you have to make sure you don't get into these zero oxidation, or, or all these are it's fascinating. And this is an MOS machine. Oh, on top of that, it has a E square prom to program. So as an analog, A to D, D to A, digital E square prom. <laughs> So was that also the time when you learned about chip design or technology, process technology kind of Yes, issues? yes, because it was MOS learning about processing. Intel was in still very much a memory company, yes. right? And the microprocessor company, and of course, Ted Hoff was the you know one of the the inventor of the microprocessor 4004, and uh, another name that was there was Stan Maser, who at that time was already start to run, eventually run the Intel University program. I mentioned it because he's another good friend, but eventually he has that synopsis. You know, <laughs> so there are a lot of connections that is very kind of connected there. And um, uh, of course, we, we're going to NMOS was like fantastic, coming from PMOS. We're not into CMOS yet. And Japan Semiconductor hasn't come out yet. And it was time when you can still go next door and go into the, go into the fab. <laughs> yeah, pretty amazing time. Right. <laughs> Thinking so, that. So that was the first time you encountered the semiconductor world in terms of process technology and yes. design of chips and so yes. on. Yes, I, 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 yes, because of course you learn semiconductor in undergraduate and take some graduate course, but I was always going to the system side and the signal processing, fascinated with that side. And the I, I always fascinated with application. And Interestingly, the one thing that was, um, I, I always thought now looking back, right, at that time I don't understand organization because you see, you see the whole history of microprocessor with Ted Hoff and um, it looks like, it looks like a, a lot of a good thing happened at the same time. And, but if you look at it, he was a 12 employee of Intel and the department is called application research. So I was very, Curious. I mean, I, I would have joined regardless of what it's called, but I have never heard of application res research group, and so I become a member of that group in research. So I was always curious about application, and of course, it, we take it so seriously that regardless of how, you know, regard, you know, like Intel's operation crush. We were, I was way I was an engineer way at the back end. I'm not leading any. I'm always in the lab. But I understand the power of application. Right. So, so uh, any of the chips that you worked on, did they go into manufacturing? <laughs> not, not much of it. I mean, remember, I was in more on the application uh, research side. The 2920, uh, looking back, great machine, but uh, two problems. One is, um, took us a long time to debug. Think, all the problem we have then, exists today, right? Analog with digital. The other one is the program was location sensitive. The software was location sensitive is its location. The, because it has a divide by four clock. 
So if you place it right where the clock is, depending on the A to DD to A, which is sensitive to clock, you have a problem. How do you debug a software hardware problem? So you think about all the D to A, A to D problem, hardware software problem where the hardware is dependent where the software is located in memory. Right? So uh, by that time, I think it was obvious where the next, next architecture be. Take the A to D, D to A out of the chip. We proposed 2930. I don't know why I didn't get funded. I was not in the management decision. I was told it was not funded. So we move on. And of course, uh, I always hear back from TI, TSM320 started because they look at the Intel signal processor. And it, they, their major market at that time, now I remember some of this was in the military domain. This was a very useful uh, chip, right? And we didn't pursue that direction, but we started to pursue speech recognition at Intel at that time. So, uh, so, so uh, what was the next thing that happened? Well, the next thing was Intel decided, uh, our group, because our group was research, right? Ted said, let's go do speech recognition. <laughs> Music to my ear. I did not go there to do it. And the reason is because we had uh, 2920. And to demonstrate, we can program it in digital filters. So now we have a real good narrow band digital filter that is programmable. And uh, you can track format, you can track a lot. And we actually produce a speech uh, recognition board. I'm talking about 19, 1980, 80, 81. So it's relatively early. It's not like the first one, but we have a street transaction board. Um, which is important in the history of why eventually I also left Intel on the group, but the, uh, the, the speech transaction board eventually uh, was able to recognize 100, 150 character, plug into the thing. We call it transaction because we, not, we thought the human factors was important. And eventually we did sell a few of these, and mostly into General Motors. So I'm probably one of the few people who has spent a, a bit of time in uh, a semiconductor fab and an automotive fab at that time. Because so I was going to Willow Run probably once a month every for the whole year and a half before I left Intel. So, you know, so this was, we went into speech record. It, besides, I was taking on multiple jobs. I mean, at the, I think by 1984, three, Ted left to Atari. Right, and so I was, I mean, at one point I had three direct line reporting to the memory side, reporting, no, because we are, once you use this application, you're using bubble memory. Do you, I don't even remember bubble memory. It was a good demo for everything. Talk about demo, I, I remember one time Andy Grove demoing the speech transaction real life in a, in the either in the customer or shareholders meeting, and it's got to be one of the first exact demoing speech recognition. You know, I'm talking about 1984, 85. I, was, as an engineer, we were all kind of really scared to death, worried that <laughs> hope this thing, hope this thing will. When you say red, it better say red. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you don't want to type it in, right? <laughs> you just want it to work. <laughs> Intel is a great training ground for me. It shapes a lot of my. Uh, it shapes a lot of my understanding of business and, and technology. Yeah, you got to work with very diverse areas. Yeah, I think I was lucky. I, um, of course, eventually become, after, after he left Intel, we become good friends uh, with Albert Yu. You know, he was like a mentor all the time. I think when I joined, he was not there. I believe he left to China to form some company. He was always very entrepreneurial, and then he came back, and so. I think uh, his emphasis was also on quality. Yes, on quality, on system. But he has uh, several things that help. Um, he, at that time, he say in t many of the uh, many of the uh, engineers, senior engineers, were foreign born, and Intel has a very strong constructive confrontation. Yeah. It's not my culture <laughs> or my character. <laughs> so he said, "You guys better learn this culture, and the best way, like." everything in the, the best way is you go teach it. So he formed a group of six or seven of us and said, you go teach multicultural integration, go teach how to fit this constructive confrontation with whatever character you have. And it 
turned out to be a great learning exercise because I like what was, you know, I think it shapes a lot of my future management thinking and everything else. So Albert was, uh, I mean, I remember uh, just, I mean, I didn't work directly with them, but you're looking at them, you're very impressed, right? I worked directly with Ted all the time, day to day. I think he reported at that time to Vadas and then to Andy Grove and then to Golden Moore to Bob Noyes. I mean, I, I actually, at that time, as an engineer, you don't know what reporting is or not. They just, you look, you just in awe every day, like, <laughs> these pretty smart guys around you <laughs> that, that do things. And then Craig Barrick joined our company, our company and Intel. I guess he always was there, and then uh, he moved the group to Oregon, uh, to I mean to Phoenix. There was nobody there yet, so our group was called the Telecom Automotive Military Operation, right? Because signal processing, because the group when I joined was the first Kodak filter, again because of uh, switch capacitor. That's how you can do the A to D, D to A, right? The, right switch capacitor and uh, the mu law, A law, Kodaks and. It's, I think it's called a 2912. I can will come to me, and so that group moved to uh, Phoenix. So a lot of people move, which eventually is important <laughs> in the story because, but but later on, but um, Ted didn't want to move. Ted said he's not moving, so I I wasn't asked to move, you know. So that's how I knew a lot of people in Phoenix and uh, and Intel is great doing that, right? So I ended up with, uh, has they moved, and then has Ted moved. Uh, one of the group uh, in, that didn't move was also the Datacom group. And I was involved with that because they were very good engineers like Bob Beach and David Ye, and I mean, they, they are, they're Datacom. Because Intel is the, I believe, one of the three. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but historically, I think the three companies that defined the Ethernet, digital equipment, Xerox, and and, Intel. And so Intel had the 82586, the first Ethernet chip out there, right? Which eventually spawned a lot of Internet people you can see there, right? It's important because eventually as I left Intel, we were, I was always with that group. And Ethernet was 802.3. And of course, at that time, was 802.5 was IBM with the token uh, ring, was another standard. And one standard that people were pushing was 802.4 which is the MAP protocol, the Manufacturing Automation Pro I don't know what A stands for, but because in the, in the automotive fab, the key thing with Ethernet is it's non-deterministic in theory, right? But if a robot want to hit it in one microsecond and stop, you have to stop it. So the theory at that time was you have to have something like MAP. And I just explained, uh, maybe not, that I was doing speech recognition and we were installing switch recognition pain inspection system at General Motors. So we were now connecting MAP cables and Ethernet cables. So it become a little bit convoluted. <laughs> it's a straight life. Life takes many turns. Now it gets into that stage. Right. So. So, uh, so now uh, you're at Intel, and you mentioned that uh, eventually you move from Intel. So. How was that transition? What made you move from Intel? As a, what made me move it's a, it's a lot, it's, it's a, it's a difficult story because I really don't want to live in Intel. I think I, if life didn't take a change, I think I would still, I hope I would not have been fired, but I would be working still at Intel as a researcher. Oh, but um, we did a lot at Intel, and uh, there was a General Motors task force. Now remember, I'm in the engineering under the lab. I, I don't actually know all the different structure, but know there was a GM task force in Oregon. And Intel was trying to sell a lot more processor there. And um, we were in speech, rec we had a speech team. We were very proud of ourselves, 15 people or so. We sold a million dollar or so, and then actually much more than that, of paint inspection to uh, General Motors. And the reason at that time was because uh, I believe Ross Perot and EDS just joined GM. They bought somehow they were, and they wanted to modernize their quality control. And you can tell the story why you want to have data into it, like what is the ping, what is the peeling, all these other things, because there's no easy way to capture it. 
but with EDS coming in to control IT, they were. So we sold these systems. Um, it was complex, you need the system, you need the wireless, you need the orders, and uh, so Intel said this team has to move to Oregon. And uh, early on, remember I said move from Cleveland to Intel, I told my wife, it's a good place, you make the next call. You know, wife has, uh, my wife Rebecca, is a great pianist, but has um, very good recall. She said, you told me I did the next choice. She said, We're <laughs> we did go to Oregon, and uh, was, she decided not to go. I was devastated because I love my job, love Intel, love the speech group, love. Uh, but so I start actually I start commuting up and down, and eventually after a while uh, broke my eardrum. I, I'm workaholic. I love my job, so uh, couldn't fly anymore. So took the train. You know, it's a 19-hour train to Oregon. And after, I think, two times, three times, I thought this can continue. So then I, I always thought, I mean, actually, uh, interestingly, I, it's one of the few times Andy Grove talked to me. He said, hey, you move thousands of miles here. You won't move a few hundred in more colorful languages. <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> Every time you see me, you know, even last few years, are you still working on speech recognition? <laughs> but... Um, uh, I said, this is, I can't do this. So I went consulting. I thought, maybe you guys will change your mind. That's very naive. Companies should not change their mind. So I went consulting by myself. In, um, actually, was installing some system for American Express in speech recognition. Yeah. But that doesn't last long because consulting is a, it's not my ideal job. It's a very, um, it's a very lonely job because <laughs> you don't have colleagues, you know. And surprisingly, uh, NEC call, and the salespeople there call me and say, why don't you come and run the application? And, you know, I, I say I was very lucky, but because at Intel, I met a lot of salespeople who were my friends. Now, I was in, under t I was, have no relationship with the customer, but um, because I was not on a, I, I looking back because I was not on a clock clock at any time a salesperson from Asia or from East Coast come and say, Could you talk to one of the customer? I if I could I always say yes. So I ended up uh at that time the uh, person in the person running NEC in the US here was Hank Josephic, which is the East Coast uh sales head for Intel. Who, who, who went to NEC, right, after Echel Bag and Frank Gills um, had the sales. And then the head of Asia Pack sales was uh, Chris Lincoln, who became a very good friend. He's a, one of my best friends there. So he said, why don't you come over? Because before I left, they offered me several jobs. One was, I always thought was very strange. Chris said, why don't you go over and run Intel China for, for the sales portion? And I like, me? <laughs> I mean, I had no skill. But I ended up taking my wife to Beijing and look at apartment and everything. And she said, no, we're, we're staying here. <laughs> but I was surprised. I, I mean, at that point of my career, I was very much a, uh, you know, NMOS, now CMOS, a few micron, <laughs> architect, microprocessor type of guy. Not in, But they say, why don't you take over this? It was new, right? So because I went to China a few times to help fix some of the PC board assembly line and things like that. So it was a very strange path to NEC, and at NEC I was uh, uh, heading the application group, and within a probably six months, I was the general manager of the microprocessor for North America. Hmm. Yeah. So it, how did that happen, to starting from applications to heading the... Well, I was... Uh, I credit Intel culture being constructive confrontation, so you speak your mind. Uh, I went from there to NEC, which has a very good culture, but a very different culture, a very consensus culture, um, which I didn't know till later that, um, well, maybe you, should, maybe you should approach it in a different way. <laughs> but you learn, right? And um, so I always point out what's wrong with the microprocessor and what's good. I mean, this, uh, it doesn't mean it's... Is, is, 
you're pointing out something not right, it doesn't mean it's not good. But so you you look at it, and uh, if you back up a bit, the when I joined Intel, we're very good friends with NEC. On the signal, remember, one of the first signal processors was 7720 from NEC and speech recognition set, and there were a lot of cooperation back and forth. In the middle period of my Intel career, there were a lot of problem because uh, patent dispute, V20, V30, the 8080, 8086, you, you know what I mean? This, yes. this is the whole history in here, right? So interestingly, of course, Ted was very involved. I was not, because I was not, I was, <laughs> I, I was a, a, a worker in the, somewhere in the chain. Now I'm the general manager of Microsoft NEC, and the lawsuit was going on. And later on, it was actually settled while I was still the general manager. The litigation and it was, what verdict came down, et cetera. But meanwhile, the V20, V30, there was an, another product called the V60 and V70. It was a 32-bit, 64-bit microprocessor going up there. And I didn't think it was a right process. I, I, I questioned as the general manager why go in that direction. Uh, probably questioned too directly. So then it was all over to Tokyo and say, what do you mean? And then there's a V100. The NEC has fantastic technology people and management team. I, I, I so, really so the development was all in Japan, right? There was no development here yes, in the US? Yes, which I didn't realize yeah. because um, when I was at Intel, all my NEC friends was very technical and they were all in Japan. When, I, when my team recruited me to NEC, I thought this is fantastic didn't realize really that all the development was elsewhere and this is more of a distributor slash sales, right? And uh, luckily, um, I was able to get a lot of people talking to on the technical level because I know, and so, um, so therefore very soon they said, you, why don't you be the general, why don't you be the general man? What do you suggest? <laughs> You know, so um, that's how it happened. Yeah. That's how it happened because uh, we got fantastic people at NEC on the application team, but it was treated too much like a distributor. So there were not resources, no equipment, no. And very importantly, uh, if we have time, we should talk about the store. Very importantly, no documentation. So you go to a customer and you give uh, documents in the rough. I mean, he's in Chinese, you just can't. And I, I came from Intel application team, right. right? You need to have board, you need to have system, you need to have all this. And the documentation was not there. And has a dis, has a has the sales off. We got great sales team from Intel coming in, right? Really good customer, good products, but not enough documentation. So as the application part, I I, I basically strong arm myself into a lot of documentation. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, as a sideline, um, I was at Intel uh, around that time, and uh, Tom Dunlop, who was the attorney, yes. head of uh, the Intel attorney, he uh, was he was not familiar with microcode, okay. so he asked me to help him with microcode because they were going to analyze the. Uh, and you see microcode to see if there was any uh, theft of uh, you know, IB. Right, 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 right. So actually, it's interesting. Um, when copy, go back to the documentation later, but eventually, uh, well, it's why I always admire Sun and Spa. I said, okay, we should look for a different architect. We should look for a different, at least argue. I'm not a, I mean, they, they got fantastic technical people. So I think I remember looking at the Spark, looking at the um, MIPS processor, and looking at the precision. So then you need two, two people to agree, right? You need to licensee and licensor, right? And the deal we eventually struck was with, with um, Bob Miller and MIPS, right? And uh, because the, the nice thing is at that time, MIPS also have a few Intel people. I think the fellow and Tom Real, because RIS processor, well, it's, it's like a signal pro. It's not ex like, but it's reduced instruction. It's no very dedicated. So know some of the people there. And we ended up with the MIPS processor, and I was mainly the one driving it with uh, Sasaki-san, who was assigned 
to help me. He was one of the three board members of the semiconductor. So this was important because eventually Sun Hansen became head of the semiconductor and then become head of all NEC corporation. And basically we came here to negotiate uh, with one reason it was difficult was because like any fabless company, you have to fab, and their fab partner was Toshiba. And they very clearly said they only want one Japanese semiconductor and one European. I think we ended up with Siemens, and the, the strong sentiment was with Toshiba. It, it, because of familiarity, right? I mean, you know what the curve is, you know the chip, you look at the early uh, MIPS was all Toshiba fab. You know, and so uh, as, the, as the U.S. side, I spent a lot of time. Trying. Right. So you were still living in the U.S. Oh, I was always living in the U.S. Okay. So now it's so always. So that was very interesting. How you know you were head of the processors, but uh, development was there, but you were living here. Yeah, so. but I was not. I was the general manager of microprocessor, uh, reporting to the president of NEC U.S. But really, the technical power and the decision is in Tokyo, right? But um, Dr. Kani, who is the head of that very strong-minded person, uh, very technical, very good person. I mean, good technical people are strong-minded. <laughs> they believe what they believe. It doesn't mean they don't like what you say, but you better have something to say, right? So I think without Intel training, I would not be so open. Because I, I don't think it was person. I don't think I did it for myself. I said, look, this is why it's wrong. You know, you can't sell a processor whose number one thing is ADA, because the only one that use ADA is the the main person is the U.S. military, and they're not going to use a sole source Japanese part. <laughs> I mean, it, it is, you can. <laughs> so there are many reasons that you can put down not to win a debate but just kind of maybe doesn't make sense, right? So, um, and then the nice thing was even as I joined the engineering force in 1978 and worked with NEC, those guys are now the uh, department heads. They're very technical, they're department heads. So they at least give me the day of time to have this argument. I didn't win every argument, but uh, we ended up by saying, okay, if, if so, why don't you go find a licensee? And, and when to get MIPS, and then finally get the MIPS processor. And I think uh, MIPS processor was important because it got NEC to the Nintendo, to, to, to the next generation of microprocessor. A quick question on documentation becoming important. It, um, on the history of floppy disk controller, NEC was very high, right? 765, I know Kawakami-san was the inventor. And, and then later on there was a, um, uh, the next generation we lost, if, because it went to the digital f uh, phase lock loop. At that time, the phase lock loop was analog. And it's pretty magical how you get all the, well, only is all the A to D, how you get it, a thing to lock at that time, or the, with the right capture range and everything. And, but we document everything. And I think you, you, if I recall right, that somewhere 10 years after I left, I got a thank you note. They say thank you for all the documentation you insist on paying from NEC legal department. Because there was a major lawsuit on the floppy disk in, uh, 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 that was given a verdict and jury in, in Texas in US that sued all the floppy disk controller for a bit that was dropping. And if I recall, and again, the legal side here to go locked down, I think Toshiba, I know to, for sure Toshiba pay a big fine. I think it's on the order of hundreds of millions of billion. And NEC did not pay anything because they were able to show that this error was clearly documented, was very well documented. <laughs> it was exactly how it, it behaved, exactly how it behaved. In quite an error again, because it drops, and then what do you do? You have to worry about it, right? So, so it was interesting. It had nothing to do with the consequence. So one lesson learned was working with good people and just working good intent and just keep pushing has many effects later on that that's certainly not my intention, <laughs> right? So 
uh, what's interesting after by that time I was uh, already at Synopsis. Okay, so yeah. tell us about that transition then from NEC. Okay, so my whole career is, a, I'd say, is more of an accidental <laughs> journey, right? <laughs> Some Intel I choose to go. <laughs> I think Intel I didn't choose to leave, <laughs> but I leave, of course I left. Uh, and then you see, I did not apply, but people pulled me in. I did not apply for 30 jobs and got one or 30. I was very, I was pushing very hard to get a engineering team into NEC because it's not possible to have the, not, not the whole engineering team, some engineering team. Uh, it was very difficult to fulfill my customer requirement when you have changes and you're technical. And you, it, earlier you mentioned that it's exactly my problem. I got the part, I got the test, uh, but uh, there, there are multiple issues because you cannot change the, you cannot respond fast enough. Uh, I have a very really long talk with NEC. They say, they say no, we need to keep. It, 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 it's a very, I understand now, as I mentioned, somebody asked me something, there are many things I don't want to do, even though it makes sense or not make sense. Out of the blue, I got a call from a friend from Synopsis. Uh, his name is Bob Dorberg. But life is one accidental thing or one pretty thing because uh, Bob, uh, was the first marketing guy for 2920. I was a young engineer, he was a young MBA that just came here. Uh, we haven't touched with each other for a long time. We worked together day in, day out. Right? And then he went to Phoenix, and then he left, and he went to Daisy. And at Daisy, then he became one of the first marketing guy at Daisy, one of the first marketing guy at uh, Synopsis. I mean, we're basically a different path. He called one day and said, oh, we're in a good company, why don't you come and join us and run a, um, an interview and uh, run a look at application. I mean, I was, I was looking for, I think I don't have much interest, you know, because I'm very busy. I'm trying to win over. So, but he says, at least have a lunch. I have a lunch with, uh, at that time, the CEO was Harvey Jones. And uh, Harvey Jones was the president of Daisy. I don't even know how, Harvey's a very persuasive guy. <laughs> He, he's a very persuasive guy. <laughs> he talked to me, he said, you. And I don't think there was any particular position. I don't know for sure. You do ask uh, later on Art, who's a founder, right, of course, right? Uh, he said, you should run the application side. Because, you know, now there's, there's a getting to, it wasn't like a plan for the, but the, between TED, application research, application, NEC, general uh, application. So I interviewed with uh, Art. And then Deirdre, who's an equal employee, who's still here, this, I thought, well, these are very smart people, <laughs> very good. So I joined Synopsis. Uh, it was a hard time leaving NEC. I still had a lot of friends. In fact, I'm probably one of the few people who left, and then they still, they actually invite me back to be a board of 10, 15 years ago, uh, on the board of uh, director of the NEC Electronics America. So I was still very much a good standing <laughs> even though I didn't really want to leave, but they didn't want to run engineering there. Things had changed. So I went to Synopsis, and that time there were four executives. Harvey Jung was CEO. Art was a VP of engineering. I was a VP of application, and there was a CFO, Dwight Morita, who came from GE also, because they all came from GE. This is 1990 now, right? I've joined NEC from 86 to 1990, and I believe MIPS was signed around 89 or so, <laughs> you have a whole history of Spark and MIPS. <laughs> oh, I was very excited about that. And also, interestingly, um, NEC decided to take a leap also, not only the OUT 2000, but OUT 3000, but also the OUT 6000, which is a bipolar one. And um, there was one other project I worked on at uh, Intel early day was the uh, bit slice microprocessor forgot exactly what the number was, but uh, but there were two problems. It was a bipolar, <laughs> okay, and, uh, as we're doing this one. The other was a two-bit slice. Okay, of course, AMD then came out with a 2900 with a four-bit slice as a right size, and it was not bipolar, right? So, um, so that's why I, at that time, was still very much MOS bipolar. Uh, uh, 
That's my whole introduction to bit and to the Hudson digital equipment also do, doing the bipolar version of the MIPS processor, which I don't think, as far as I know, had not much commercial success, all of us. You know, a spark was coming out. <laughs> you know, HP has a precision architecture, I think. Uh, no, I think it's each. I forgot who has it. But um, I joined, there were four executives, and because the, we, we didn't have VPs of sales, I mean, Harvey was really running sales, I was really, I was, I was running the field. So I started a lot of, uh, I think at, at Synopsys, I was responsible for the application focus, and then uh, for most of the globalization. Because that's when I opened up the Taiwan office, the, the, the India office, the, of course, by that time, we have sales coming in. And we have two VP of sales, um, uh, Alana Bard and Brian Connor, running, one running US, one running international. But I was running all the applications. So therefore, we are always very much involved with the field. So my career started to also start to move again into much more of a general manager, field-oriented, which, which I love. So. That's how I got to, anyway, that's how I got to Synopsis. Another sideline, um, around that time, I think I was at Fujitsu, I was also approached for the same job. Oh. And uh, I interviewed at Synopsis. At Synopsis. Oh. And, but I was running an engineering operation and all that, so I didn't, I think it was same uh, applications group that they wanted to hire. Uh -huh. And so I didn't gel, you know, because oh, we should I compare <laughs> notes. <laughs> yes. Was it what what month? I joined in May of 1990, and I probably was approached in January or February. Or, or is yeah, it I can't there? remember the exact dates. Yeah. We, we should compare. We notes. should compare <laughs> notes because you're right. Because um, it wasn't very clear exactly what it was because at that time there was a few applicants. Uh, when I finally joined, the group that right away important to me was uh, the university program, documentation, quality, application, and the CAE it was not uh, exactly what I signed up because it was changing. Right, right. right. So that's what I remember too. It was not clear oh, what the role right. was and going to be. And networking. I pulled most of the original cable. I see. <laughs> <laughs> because it was like, uh, well, quality should be an engine. I, I was, I was lo looking for, it has to be this or that. You are right, you remind me because the thing morph as you go. And uh, early on, I remember I mentioned Stan Mazur. Well, he was running the university program at, uh, at Synopsis. So it was, it was wonderful. I go there, I see, um, it was like, like <laughs> it's Bob Dorberg, it's, uh, and then you, you meet new people, of course, right? I mean, I was there, I mean, it was very much running it, uh, Harvey. So I, I felt very welcome, and I felt like uh, I was passionate about design and the methodology, and I saw, uh, in fact, we start, the minute we do this, we start, I wanted the universal book because we started the book, design methodology book in, at, at Synopsis, and then do a lot of applications, right? So build up the whole application team and everything else. And I believe they also had the IP group, which they also wanted to somehow have add value. Uh, yes, so this. it was 1990, and believe we were six million going to nine million, and believe Cadence and Mentor was, uh, I, I was in the 200, 400 range. I don't, they were very big, right? And um, uh, we were, but we think, we, we had good technology, we were pushing on customers, and but by 92, I, I was advocating very much designware and IP. Uh, and one reason is, well, you know, today we still can really synthesize a wash multiplier. You still need designer. You know, we need good tools, but we really need good designers. And so um, we start designing, I started the uh, designware group. I moved from being the VP of application to the GM of designware group, which not determine what it is. And uh, one difficulty I remember having is I believe, what I believe and what I want to do is slightly different. What I want to do is MIPS processor, Spark processor, I mean the super duper. What we have to do in my mind was basic building block. Memory, 
uh, multiplexer, decoder, <laughs> right? I mean, to build it up. And the, the first group that I uh, recruited, the difficulty was recruiting design engineer to a synopsis. Because you don't want bad designer designing your basic block, right? But when, you know, one of our team members was a oil expert at that time in, uh, or design expert at that time in uh, SCSI 2. He said, what do you want me to design? <laughs> How about a decoder? How about a 4 by 2 decoder? How about 2 by you know what I mean? But it has influence because those uh, eventually gets into the tool to distinguish, you want a two by four or four by two, and why do you want a one by eight? I mean, there's, there are cost functions with it that had to be trade off. And so uh, the design where an IP group, now we're now number two in the business uh, next to ARM, has gone through multiple things. I'm very proud of the work that, uh, I think we have four general managers since. Uh, I, I'm the first one, then Deirdre Hanford took over, then John Chilton, then Yakum. Those guys have at Yakum Kunku, they have added tremendous v different view to this basic block. Mm -hmm. They actually added quality focus, they added the interface, the USB, and so uh, I, that's why I think I was lucky. I feel like that was the right move. Uh, at that time, if you remember, our competitor and some of the, uh, was designing TSM320, our boat building block, um, microcontroller blocks and everything. It was so complex, you cannot use it in the, and I, 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 have, I have design envy because I want to design those, right. you know, but it didn't seem the right strategy, you know, and it just, it's gonna take longer. Now the parts we call designs are very complex. So I was very happy to, you know, go from the application side to the IP side, you know, so, yeah. So, Further in within uh, Synopsis, how did your career oh. then advance? So now we are into, I think Synopsis is like 28 plus years. Now we're into uh, second year going to the uh, design wear side and then now put actually Dahlberg and uh, Deirdre them in charge of the field. And a few years later, I think two years, uh, of course, Art has already went from VP of Engineering to VP of Marketing to CEO. The new VP of Engineering, um, uh, at that time, Harvard was still running, said, you, uh, you have to run engineering. I mean, I, I didn't want to run, in, I mean, I've run engineering, I run, but it's also, this is not my, this is not my design engineering. So I, uh, he said, you have to run engineering. <laughs> no choice, not ran engineering. I was a VP of engineering for the whole company. And pretty soon it was clear that you should have all the marketing and things combined. So within a year or so, I was the general manager of the first business unit group called the design group, which has all the marketing and all of this group in. And since I worked well, very closely with the field and the AC, it was very, very easy to move the product and design the product, right? So as a general manager, and of course, um, one thing I did as Synopsis, together with, of course, all the exec, is uh, we have, I think I've gone through all of the 90 acquisitions, all the 90 M&A and the integration. So always looking to see what else we can acquire in order to further our movement, you know. And you can see the uh, M&A side for, at that time we didn't have physical, for example, right? right. So uh, one of our first one was Epic, right? which turned out to have multiple integration issue. I mean, I was young and naive. <laughs> I'm, I'm still young, <laughs> maybe less naive. <laughs> but uh, uh, start to understand how to integrate company. And so, um, don't get me wrong, our motto in M&A doesn't mean we know. We, our motto in M&A now is uh, only make new mistakes. <laughs> okay, and it's much harder than you than one thing because we still make the same mistakes, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so we were involved with that, and so I was in the general manager position of design group. Of course, we also acquired uh, a few years later uh, View Logic to get into verification. So now I've become more full line and need someone to understand most but of it. But the VCS portion was there already, right? No, it was no? from ViewLogic. ViewLogic, okay. Yeah, yeah, the View, 
a little bit of history. Um, now remember, history is all written by all, all other people of different disciplines. I remember trying to acquire um, Sunrise uh, in test, and Viewlogic acquired it. Uh, I remember trying to acquire Chronologic, and Viewlogic acquired it. And we were interested in most of and we didn't we didn't talk I I talked to view I talked to Chronologic, I talked to uh, Sunrise. Very almost can can complete it, lost the so we said, you know, bite the bullet, let's go acquire view logic. <laughs> so view logic gave us VCS. Well it was chronologic, VCS, uh, gave us the a lot of the tests and motive. And at that time we're in prime time. Right. So it was uh, that acquisition helped move us propel forward quite a bit. And one of our key staff member came from uh, one of our key staff member came from um, uh, ViewLogic, Manoj Gandhi, who is now running our verification group. Right. Yakum Gungo came from Cadiz, which we acquired in '94. So Synopsis has 13,000 people today. 30% of them came from the uh, acquisition company. And, uh, but it's more than 30% on the, of the five business group, a lot headed by people from those groups. So I think the verification aspect, you had very good relations with Sun in terms of yes. the development of the tools. Yes. From, from what yes. I recall. Yes, thank you. Thank you for all your history. And of course, because Sun was leading in a lot of the verification need and you know, listening to the customer, driving, pulling it, uh, and Sun was, well, you, you are teaching customer. <laughs> you have very complex need, right? Interestingly, though, at that time, remember, we, um, uh, we talk about the IP side, and we said talk, we're talking about the simple blocks. And one of our philosophy was always that verification and the IP were two sides of the same coin. And because, because you know it well, the verification takes yeah, uh, 50, 60% of a design cycle time. Maybe not effort, whatever, this is a big chunk, it's not 10%. That's if you verify your own design, right? If you are buying IP block, the theory of buying IP block is you don't want to design it so it's faster. But if you take more than 60, 70 percent, you will never buy an IP block, right? So verification become a critical element. Not so much, of course, the design had to be compatible, right? So in the early days, it's almost like anyone can design that block better than you can. So then why do you want to buy it? Well, because it's easier to verify and because you didn't have to take the time and because it is a common block, you know. So that was the philosophy that we go about building that part. It has morphed into a very different business now because USB 3.1 is pretty diff difficult and eventually you know there's a USB 4.0 and eventually a 5.0 and eventually something. Right. So you mentioned Epic uh, in terms of the physical, but that was more of a static timing for yeah. the uh, More of a transistor level. Transistor level. Yeah. But then the actual physical tool, I mean, Avanti uh, became a big, so how was that decision made to get into the physical? Yeah, we always knew we wanted to get a full line, right, as a partner, as a, uh, uh, it's just a history. I think by 897, I joined 97, by 97 I was a uh, uh, executive VP and then the chief operating officer. And then probably by 98, for the last 20 years, I was two in a box with uh, on, on the board of Synopsis. I was uh, always the president and COO, and then the last five, six years, I don't remember exactly when, uh, six, seven, eight years, I was uh, president and co-CEO. But uh, basically, we're two in a box all this time. And we always have thinking about what else to do in the acquisition. And we try many times, we talked to Avante many, many times, when, when, uh, when it was called something else, when it was just, before it went public. Yeah. And we could never complete it. And of course, then they went through a huge lawsuit with Cadence and all that. And the minute the criminal side was closed, we started negotiating. And then we closed the deal in 2002, right? But it's probably a, I would say, a six, seven years from the first time we talked to the time we closed. And in between, it doesn't mean we continue talking, we just drop off and they do something else. And 
uh, many of the key uh, execs in Avante, like Paulo, is still with the company in key key positions. And uh, Avante is a key is uh, a key for us to get into the physical world. Yeah, yeah I mean from a customer side, I know we've dealt with all of that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I apologize for all the problems. No. <laughs> I know you should. Including uh, on the spice side, eight spice yes. and all that. Too. Yes. Yeah. So that's what I mean by we have acquired a 90 plus company, but those company, some of them has acquired many company. Like, as you said, Spice, TMA, uh, Persim on OPC, like 20 company, right? I mean, and so Synopsys has about 90 companies uh, that acquire, and those 90 companies acquire about 90 other companies. So it's like 180. Right. <laughs> Like one uh, person that I interviewed, Professor Tom Callot, okay, uh, Stanford, uh, you know, numerical technology. Numerical technology. So all of the phase shift mass yes. technology, you know. So yes. I know you yes. acquired that as well. Interestingly, right? Because we go after numerical technology because of the phase shift mass, because um, uh, all these issues of. Um, OPC, double patterning, all, all these things were coming up, so phase shift map pattern was important. The main reality we got out of that was not that, was CAS, right? The, the, the poly, uh, GDS to polygon, <laughs> main value. In fact, uh, we, but because it turned out it's mathematically, effectively a very interesting problem and you can grind on it and that still become a good business, in fact, um, uh, I said that we lead a lot of acquisition in, and globalization. China and India, but some other place we were in that's interesting is Armenia, and we talk more about it because we're pre. Yeah. And then the other one is Chile. Okay, and Chile is one of the places where we're doing a lot of the cast work because there's a lot of mathematicians. Right, right. right. So, so I think acquired Virage Logic. Yes. And, yes. Uh, Zorian, uh, I know him oh, very well. Oh, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, we, so interestingly enough, uh, of course, Yuvan is also Armenian-American or Canadian, but expert in tests, right? So all these become very important as you go into automotive, right? This self, uh, the self, the self-test and repair memory and all these uh, reliability. And uh, when we acquired um, Varage, we were the largest employer of high tech in Armenia, in Yerevan. And the second largest was Varaj. <laughs> and so we become one of the largest in high tech in, in Armenia. Yeah. So, yeah, th that's right. You do know, you know, a, well, you know a lot of people. <laughs> well, outside synopsis, too, but you know a lot of people. So, so tell us more about anything else you'd like to talk about synopsis. Well, so synopsis, we uh, now 13,000 people. Um, really in three lines of business, ETA, the IP business, and about four or five years ago, we decided to look for a third leg of a business. And about four years ago, I actually started living in San Francisco to run the software cybersecurity group. We started off by buying a company called Coverity. I don't you know, another Stanford startup, um, because they're a static code checker, right? And Amazingly, when we started our career in design, we don't all use static timing in this chip design, but now 100% use static timing. Nobody, I would say very small percentage of all software engineers in the world, 10%, 20%, use static code checker. Question is, why wouldn't you use it? <laughs> you can see buffer overflow, which is the one of the biggest problem. You know, you, you, you just don't follow the buffer. Uh, and m many of the internet hacking is taking advantage of that. So we took um, to everything we start to say we need to move into the security business because, because it is the headline and it's where money are in. And also, if you don't have quality, you sure don't have security. If you're quality, maybe you can do other things get security. So we have acquired seven or eight companies there. One of them is called Codinomicon, which that's the fussing of IP especially USB, DDR side. So there's some relationship. It's like I'm trying to point out that we jump into the third field, but we are not a like a big risk-taking type of company. We're a very deliberate, <laughs> I wouldn't say concerned, but very steady kind of approaching it. And then we bought a Citadel, which is a, 
uh, one of the leading internet uh, uh, cyber attack consultant type of security, and recently bought Black Duck, which is the largest open source analysis called software composite. So that business is now about 10% of synopsis, right, in the cybersecurity software space. And software is important. So between, um, I, I draw a quick analogy why eventually these two will even meet, because I talk about st synopsis, a lot of mathematicians, statical checker, pathfinding, reachable state, non-reachable state, think about formal verification, you know well. You know, instead of looking at very long, you need to look at C++, Java, P, and there's no. Um, VCS, you mentioned, we're very much a compiler expert. This is a lot of compile execution type of issue. So between all those, we just started, uh, that's where some of my concentration are today. Yeah, you also acquired a Tranta. A Tranta, yes, um, yes, yes. So in terms of overall growth of the company, you know, you certainly are number one. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I think Cadence faltered for some time, and uh, I guess they are doing better now. But yes. uh, Mentor, of course, was acquired. So the three big, of the three big, you know, you continue to grow as a company. Right. Right now, we are growing faster than they are. Yeah. Right now, if you count uh, the year that passed or the last year, right, and, and the last, last two years. And they, they're a very respectable competitor, right? I mean, they're... <laughs> Actually, you never want to be in a business where there are no competitors. <laughs> Nobody else wants to be in. Right? They're very respected. So we have, it's not, and, and, uh, and the customer base for semiconductor is shrinking, as you know, right? Uh, and the uh, technology is getting tougher, right? Physics, so that's a, well, you, you know it well. So I think as an engineer, there are no better time than to be in this business at this moment because it's so exciting. As a business person, <laughs> it's always a challenge, right? So, on one hand, the technology in terms of the FinFET and, and so on, that's more challenging, more expensive. Um, in terms of strategies uh, for AI and deep learning, I mean, there's a lot of new requirements, right? Right. Would you say? So, how is the overall strategy for Synopsis affected by all the changes uh, that are happening? Right, so we know that there are probably three or four directions out there that we cannot miss. Um, and then we need to pay a part. And if you are very conscious of the market and customer, then you'll probably be in the right quadrant, right? So, and then you need to be the best in that quadrant. But first you have to be in the right quadrant. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so there are a few things that are very clear that are going on. One is the whole electrification of vehicles. No, not necessarily auto autonomous car, but the whole electrification of vehicles. So there, uh, all the tools have to be recertified because what is the main difference between designing a chip for automotive versus designing a chip for mobile? Of course, there are many different applications, but what are the standout? One standout is documentation. You need to have much more documentation. Who did what to whom, <laughs> right? Uh, so the tool can have to provide that, or how you get that. The second one is failure in time, because you don't carry a 10-year-old cell phone. You probably will. I drive more than 10-year-old car. So the failure in time become a, a different element, right? So uh, as an engineer, we all know time is a fundamental unit, <laughs> right? So that is a, and then there are many other different. So be, that means two had to be certified, the EDA side. The IP had to be recertified had to be documented. I mean, for example, we now, every team has to have a safety manager. That, that term does not exist five years ago, right? Who certified the safety uh, proceeding of this? And then, of course, interestingly, we, I say we have three business, the ETA, the IP, and the software. The software side is very much involved because one questions to many of the automotive company, how many lines of software do you have? It turned out to be a lot but they don't necessarily have a very good count because they come in from the tire pressure, from Harman Kardon, from windshield wiper, from, right? How many lines of those codes are open source? How many lines of those open source are not fixed but are known? Right, I mean, so uh, the, the three businesses are somewhat tied in this, bus in, in, in this kind of quadrant uh, and within the automotive different quadrant. The second one is, of course, AI. 
because AI is a very big, I do believe is a very big influence and it comes about because they are data and because they are, thanks to Sun and thanks to you, a lot of computational expertise. Because if you have big data, you don't have computation, you know, therefore memory. So it's all good for our business, but where is AI taking? We need, where should we be? So within uh, the way I look at it with synopsis is one, we have to make sure that our tools are using the right technology. And of course, EDA tools, as you know, are very algorithm and rule based. And AI is very much data driven and pattern matching, right? Uh, they're not exclusive, but they're different, right? So there's a turn in thinking of all these, right? And then the second thing is on the AI front, besides making sure our own tool is, there's a whole new group of people designing AI chips. How are they designing it? I mean, we want to make sure they are our customers. Right? But there's another, another dimension, which is how do we use AI more effectively with customers? Because they all know, it's not like we have to spell it out for them. They all want to know, they're all doing something. right? And then the last one is, are there other opportunities for us? And we don't know that. But we are very much involved with uh, getting our own team uh, educated and involved and what are the data we have, what are the data we have that are variable. Of course, we have a lot of customer data. Those are not the ones we want to monitor. I mean, they are customer's data, but we have a lot of data, right? For example, we have several hundred million lines of code we develop, right? That's why when we say we go into the software business, we actually are a software company, <laughs> even though we look like a hardware semiconductor company. So we're hoping that these things all if you're in the right area where things are kind of getting together, then it makes sense, you know. And of course, the overarching direction of things is a lot of competition are now going to the cloud. Well, I was going to ask about the cloud. So what's the, where does Synoptis stand in terms of cloud offering? I think the, I think a few years ago, we started a business and we moved away because many of the thing was too early. We, we think the cloud has several, one is security, and now that is not a big, I mean, you and I trust our credit card, our data, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, one is latency from a design. So there are some tools that still have issues on latency, because you, you, you know, if you're doing interactive, you, you can't do it. Um, the, other, the other one is just, uh, there, are many, there are many type of design that you put data in and take data out, and that it's the in and out that costs money or cost ex energy, let's just say, right? The one that sits there and keep regressing, you should be able to use. So in my mind, it's in there, we have to be, we, we are working on, uh, on the cloud. So um, in terms of a business model mm -hmm. uh, for licensing, you know, because I know Oracle has that yes. challenge, and so is that a challenge for EDA companies as well? Yes, I think for EDA company, because we're a certain business model and, um, but, you know, the business model is, is a, is a two-way conversation, right? I mean, you, you, if you don't like it, you can stop it for a while, but you can't stop, you can't stop it for long. And we are not necessarily the first one to plot, we're not pioneering in terms of the business model. As you said, or there are many people doing business on the cloud, right? And what's, possi what's not possible before is now possible and more and more possible, and it is, it's critical mass, it's clearly going that direction. It's not, gonna, it's not all gonna be off-prem next year, but it's gonna be less and less percentage, right? So, absolutely. So in my mind, those automotive, AI, cloud, uh, are all there. And of course, IoT is very undefined, right? But it's all of these, I mean, automotive is IoT in a car, <laughs> right? So, it's so, exciting time. Very <laughs> exciting time. Any mm -hmm. other future thing that you see, for example, 5G? Uh, how do you visualize 5G in terms of the IoT and so on? Yeah, I think 5G um, obviously will come about and for the vehicle is necessary because of the speed and what you do. And I do but, I'm, we are now very interested in the security. The more data, the more issue. You know, how, when, do, where do you, do you start the security at the, at the edge or the cloud? 
and the edge, you don't have enough computation, and the cloud got too much data. So I think things will, natural things will change a lot of this. It's all about risk management. And um, uh, I think Synopsys is reasonably well paced because we have good technology, we have, we have good customer, and we continue to be uh, listening to the right learning, teaching customer, we'll be okay. Because the thing is moving very fast and very complex. You know, I mean, and as you know, many other people are, um, the people that you don't think have chip design team 10 years ago are now designing chips. <laughs> and how would they go about it? You know, I mean, we better be, we better be one of the main vendors, <laughs> right? Yeah. So how is your, your co-CEO with Art? And I was wondering how uh, is your, uh, role relative to art? You know, what do you guys do in terms of managing? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, many of our staff asked that when they joined and then they stopped asking. <laughs> it just, <laughs> because it's not, it's not a linear equation <laughs> on this. Uh, I think we trust each other, we work on many things. Uh, uh, it's running, and at different years we run different things. You're running more concerned on EDA side and the strategy. I'm much, I, I'm almost uh, much more involved with the m &A, the operations, uh, financial planning, the software, the IP, but it's not exclusive one or the other. It de So in other words, it's still tending to be more COO kind of yeah. role. Yeah, COO and uh, CEO in terms of the very much involved the strat the future, like, like the AI side like the new TAM or the SIG side. This SIG is uh, software integrity, which is a software uh, business, because it's not an operating role. Uh, you, that business need to grow with the market, right? And what does that mean? Where is security going? You know, um, the other is, of course, the geopolitical situation is getting way more complex. <laughs> way more complex, you know. So, um, so as a, as a co-CEO, enjoy our role, and I don't think, you know, I don't think we want each other's job. You know, it's being a good partnership. You know. So, um, you mentioned geopolitical. Does it mean like relationships with China, relationship with European countries? Is that what you're talking about, or what's? Uh, geopolitical meaning there are more rules and more, uh, more. Uh, yeah, it's not just China, it's Europe. It's, it's, every, it's everybody, right? So uh, as, a, as a global company, how do you operate, right? Uh, what are the rules of engagement? How do you put your, uh, you know, so uh, all those you have to be make sure because obviously you stay within very, way, way beyond, you know, within the scope of what, you, what you're allowed to do. But then how do you, what do you, how do you look at the future? where all this is going. Right. Yeah. Also, <coughs> in terms of uh, H-1B visa kind of issues, yeah. where you hire yeah. people. Yeah. There are many of these things that come together that has effect, right? So uh, good news and bad news, that's a bad news. The good news is all of us are in the same boat. <laughs> we all, this, all of us in Silicon Valley or in you, our competitors in the same boat, right? So, so in terms of your personal uh, issues. Um, we didn't talk a lot about your family, but oh. uh, do you have, um, uh, in terms of philanthropy, uh, mm -hmm. are you interested in social causes, or is your family interested in that, or are you doing something in that area? Well, we are, uh, I'm active in the Chinese American community, in the relationship, and uh, not as active, but I was on the, you talked about earlier, I was on the honorary advisory team of the Aki, the Asian American committee. A lot of deal and a lot of dealing with mental as you. So, um, probably philanthropy, one of the main things we're supporting, because Rebecca is a musician, is the San Francisco Conservatory Music, you know, which uh, trying to link up with a lot of the, uh, I think on the West Coast, there is going to be a major uh, music institute in, in it already is a well-known institute, but I think it'll get better and better. So that's where um, 
we do a lot of philanthropy and exercise and on. But generally, I'm pretty low key. I mean, because I'm very low profile. But I just want to say low key. I'm very energetic, very excited, but very. Um, uh, my emphasis is on basically customers and my family. It's just my small group of family. I recently have a granddaughter from my daughter and a grandson from my son who's now 11 months old and an eight, eight month old, you know, Emerson and Cameron. So it's, it's a good life. Very exciting technology, good family. Wife Rebecca is still playing. Um, both happily married, both kids. Uh, business is, business has never been not tough. <laughs> you and I know. <laughs> There's never been a business where you don't exercise a lot of energy and thinking, you know. <laughs> Whether the economy is good or economy is bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So in terms of um, recommendations or uh, advice for future generations, people that are just starting their careers, what would be your uh, advice to a young engineer, a young entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I would tell them, uh, generally, I think, first, I think we're, we're both still young. <laughs> you know, so when I think young, I think very young. <laughs> so I think of them as, hey, number one is you have to do they, It's like a basic, you have to work hard. They, there's no easy job anywhere. The second is, uh, I think I learned this very early on from Intel, is you surround yourself with successful people. And that is a self-fulfilling thing because you have to define success. Because you can define success as somebody who's very good technically, uh, who's very well off financially, or who's very caring about the community. I mean, it's self-fulfilling. It, it, you find yourself with successful people and you have to define, it, it's, you have to define it. And that, that definition will define you. Right, and, um, and then you have to have passion. And I, I saw a lot of word on passion here, and I always thought, because I have seen people say, well, how do you get passion? Does it hit you on the head? Do you, what, it, I'm talking about marriage type of passion, about work. And I always, I would give young people advice that passion is uh, be thankful. You didn't get here without someone helping you. It's like I didn't get here without a lot of people helping me. At Intel, at NC, Synopsis, it, and, and people took a lot of effort. If you think of those, you can get passionate very fast. <laughs> you, you know, people help you without asking for other things, right? They have invested in you, you know. So those, those are my simple advice. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts you have before we? Mm, don't know. You ask so many different. <laughs> Good question, you know. Uh, I was saying one of my deepest inspiration has been from my parents, you know, seeing how my father go, uh, you know, our family has been poor and rich and poor and rich and pick up, you know, from fishing to, to trading copper to doing, to, to looking for, because we're fishing, fishing fleet, looking for treasures in the sea and all, and always being optimistic. I, I think really what I learned is being optimistic. And I've seen my mother, I, how we grew up, and she's, if I knew all the, if I understand all the situation, I would be depressed. So growing up in a happy, I have a happy childhood. And I think I have a happy academic and a happy industrial life, and I felt very lucky. And, and then meeting with a lot of good people. So maybe that's kind of shaped a lot of the way I approach problem. It doesn't mean there are no problem. So all of us actually have many issues. <laughs> it's how we deal with it. Yeah. And then how long we can continue dealing with it, right? Because there are, no easy, there are no easy, quick, in my mind, that most worthwhile things have no easy, quick solution. Somebody have done it, <laughs> you know, and jump in, so. So, I, I don't know, that's kind of what I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it.